For your viewing pleasure, this broadcast of the Municipal Council Meeting of Alpena is made possible by the funding provided by the City of Alpena. Thank you for your generosity. Good evening and welcome to the Elkina City Council meeting of September 17, 2018. Uh, call the order, please. Hess? Here. Johnson? Here. Nielsen? Here. Noah? Here. And Walgora? Here. Uh, rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, any modifications to the agenda this evening? Approval of the minutes for open session of September 4th, 2018. Any modifications, issues? Uh, citizens appearing before council on agenda or non-agenda items are allowed five minutes each to address your um, concerns. This is the only time during tonight's meeting you're allowed to address council. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. Okay, the consent agenda this evening. A is bills to be allowed in the amount of $325,270.47. B is the approval of budget amendment to carry over funds from fiscal year 1718 to fiscal year 1819 for uncompleted projects. And C is the approval of a budget amendment for $5,300 to complete the comprehensive plan update. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Ask. Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. And Walagora? Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. No presentation or announcements. We drop down to proclamations. I have two this evening. First is the Thunder Bay Folk Festival Week, September 24th through the 30th. Whereas the nonprofit Thunder Bay Folk Society has, was started in 2013 for the purpose of fostering traditional music and arts in Northeast Michigan, and whereas this is the fifth annual Thunder Bay Folk Festival, and whereas successful fundraisers, workshops, and community performances have been held to promote awareness and support the traditional uh, and support for traditional music, traditional arts, and the upcoming folk festival at the Alpina Antique Tractor and Steam Engine Showgrounds, and whereas this year's festival will be held September 28th, 29th, and 30th, 2018. Now, therefore, I, Matthew J. Walagoro, by the virtue of authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Alpena, do hereby proclaim the week of September 24th through the 30th, 2018, as Thunder Bay Folk Festival Week in Alpena, and urge all area citizens to recognize and support the efforts of the Thunder Bay Folk Society. And there is uh, quite a group of them. Next up is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas October 2018 is National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and whereas National Breast Cancer Awareness Month is a platform for educating women about the importance of early detection of breast cancer through mammography and other methods, and whereas an estimated 
266,120 new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed in American women during 2018, and about 40,920 women are expected to die this year from the disease. And whereas detection of breast cancer at an early stage greatly improves the chances for successful treatment and survival, and whereas the Zanta Club of Alpena remains dedicated to educating and empowering women to take charge of their own breast health and have organized the 12th annual Zanta Walks for Women Walk 5K run on October 6, 2018 at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Now therefore, I, Matthew J. Walagora, by the virtue of authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Alpena, do hereby proclaim October 2018 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month in Alpena and encourage all area citizens to take part and be aware of this occasion in our community. And they also have a good time. attention we may have had an announcement so it's left on our desk um, this is uh, you are cordially invited it's very difficult to read <laughs> crazy I'm sorry you are cordially invited to the unveiling of the history of industry sculptures Friday September 21st 2018 the opening ceremony is 530 to 4 uh, 530 to 545 at Washington Avenue Park on a south 11th Ride your bicycle or take a brisk walk along the Alpena Bypath between locations from 545 to 615. Parking is available at both locations for those driving between the sites. And then um, there are a, a concluding ceremony at 615 to 7 p.m. at Bandler Hall, East Lawn, near the pavilion at the Alpena Community College. Like refreshments served. That's not approval of all the rock formations. There. Okay, we'll drop down to 11, uh, report of officers, costs of the August 7, 2018 primary election. The election cost for the August 7 primary totaled $8,928.63. The largest expense was to pay the election workers for their time on election day and training beforehand, while the second largest expense was the printing of the ballots. The city had 8,177 registered voters at the time of the election. Of that number, 1,862 came out to the polls to cast their votes, and 293 were absent voters. Total voters was 2,155, which resulted in a 26% voter turnout. For the general election in November, we are anticipating the number of absentee voters to increase, and also a higher voter turnout at the polls. Because of this, it was decided to have an absent voter counting board so that those ballots would not have to be processed in the precincts. Um, I went back and did some research, and the last time that we had an uh, AV counting board was for the November general election 2014. 19% of the votes that were cast were AV. Um, and then in the November election of 2012 was the one uh, before that where we used an AV counting board. There was 1,071 AV votes, which accounted for about 22% of total votes cast. This, um, 
The August primary was the highest voter turnout in decades, according to the Secretary of State, Ruth Johnson. And she said that primaries are usually indicative of how the general election is going to turn out. So that's why I felt the need to institute an AV counting board. Okay. Um, the only other question I've got is printing of the ballots. What are you required to print? Do you print for every registered voter or 50% of every registered voter, depending on the... The election? Yeah, we don't print 100%. Um, if we do run out, we're able to print some uh, right in the polls. Okay. But um, I think for the primaries, we did about 60%. But anything that we don't use is um, we just end up shredding it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't we kind of just a... look back on how um, an equal election was like four years ago or, or something closer okay. um, and figure it out from there. Okay. I just was wondering if that had, if it was a state mandate for how many you had to print or whatever. Not that I'm aware of yet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You don't need any council action on that. That's right. Do you need a receipt file think. or no? Sure. Just informational? Well, you're asking them to approve you using an AV board. Are you? Well, What's not that? yet. That will be at our, um, our election board meeting. I'll add that on there. Okay. And, 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 and that's before the general? Right. Okay. Just receive and file? Are you good with Okay. Good I move we receive and file. Second. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Walgora? Aye. And Hess? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Um, down to unfinished business. Request to rezone half of the lot located at 316 Cavanaugh Street from R2, one family residential to P1 vehicular parking. Second reading and council action. When we were here last, uh, that was technically first reading, but council went ahead and voted. I should have jumped in and said, hey, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> I apologize for not having done so, but. I think uh, since we published and Adam reported on it in the open meeting at the last time, I think you can vote on it now. If you'd be more comfortable doing first reading and voting on it at the next one, this is not so time sensitive that it has to be approved today. Um, but you can approve it today if you wish to do so. I think not having any really even discussion or issues with it, I don't. I don't feel the necessity to wait again. Um, uh, it, it, sh do, should we take some official action on the action that we took the last time? Uh, you would just, or just basically, uh, somebody would motion again and you'd vote again. You have to, to do the second reading though first? Uh, generally don't read at the second, okay. unless somebody requests that I read it. Right. Uh, Which I'm willing to do. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Since you didn't do it last time. <laughs> I, I don't have any questions or anything like that in the ordinance. I think everything was covered pretty, yeah. you know, in detail with this last time. So, okay. um, so I move that we approve ordinance eighteen dash four four one once again. Second. <laughs> Nielsen. Is it? Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Noak. Yes. Walgora. Aye. Hess. Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Mayor, yes. we already signed this ordinance after last meeting, so I guess I'll just redo it with yes. the correct dates in it then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Bill. I think. I just decided to restart. Yeah, that's how it's leaving. <laughs> just does a couple zone things zone. to go. All right, next up new business, Goose Control Hunt. Final report from Don Gilman. Good evening. <clears throat> Uh, the hunt was successful again. It was held on the 7th, Friday the 7th and the 14th for half a day, both days. Um, we employed the same methods as last year with the dog, uh, chasing geese around in different areas in the city and just outside of the city, like the golf course. Uh, total harvest for the year was 85 geese. That's down a little bit from last year's number of 99, but that's fine. Um, there's still plenty of geese around for viewing, and I think that we did a good job in putting a dent in the local geese, the ones that stay here all the time. So with the flight starting, you know, there's always going to be more geese coming. Um, I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at, uh, there's an online magazine called Bridge Magazine, bridge.com, and they did an article um, 
a guy's name was Mike Wilkinson, and I talked to him before we actually did the goose hunt, and um, he was doing a report on the entire state because everybody has this problem, and so Alpena was one of the places that got mentioned in the article a little bit, and um, he talked to Roger with the view of the sanctuary. I thought I thought it was a well written article, and if you get a chance to look at it online, I love the headline, but uh, you may not as much. It's just uh, in Alpena, it's a death sentence. But he wasn't being facetious, he was being legitimate. And it, it seems to be that with all the places he visited, you have to spend thousands of dollars like in East Grand Rapids and they chase the geese around with dogs and they put out silhouettes. But when they get all done, the geese just went to another part of the city and they come back. And here we eliminate some of them, uh, the big herds. And it was on Insights last Sunday that the uh, TV station did a article on it. <clears throat> and if you saw that, there was a fellow in the, towards the end of the film that was there and his son had a handicap. He had a walk with a crutch. You know, they, they got 10 of the geese from us because they enjoy eating them, they can use them. And I bumped into them the day across the street and said, thank you, got them all cleaned up. So a lot of the geese went to a good cause other than just the hunters eating them. And all the geese except for one were shot at the fairgrounds this year. Um, Mishkiwis, they only got one goose the first Friday, and I think that's just because short of putting them out in the grass field, because they hunt near the uh, volleyball court, uh, the water's right up to the court, so it made it difficult to put decoys out and try to get geese to come down low enough to where you can legitimately uh, have a chance to harvest them. Uh, no incidents. I think the uh, total for the hunt's going to be around $215 uh, expense, so. and the vast majority of that was for the guy with the dog. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Or, of course, we'll evaluate next year as the season progresses and see you know, how the egg harvest and egg oiling goes and report back to council you know, by the 1st of August to see what the uh, populations are and, and what we're, we're going to do. Very good. Thank you, John. Thank you. Stephen Kyle, that report. So, so moved. <coughs> Nock? Yes. Paul Gora? Aye. Hess? Yes. Johnson? Yes. And Nielsen? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Next up, water tower mixers addendum. Rich? Uh, the current city budget has $90,000 program for installation of mixers within the two water towers, 9th Avenue and US 23 North. The city currently contracts with Suez Utility Service Company to maintain our towers. They do the inspections, the cleanings, the paintings, etc. on those. And any time uh, there's any activity on the tower, such as putting antennas up, they oversee the, um, the work done and inspect that work. Um, this is, while it is part of Suez, it's it's a, a separate subdivision, so to speak. It's a, it's a arm of Suez, but they strictly uh, work on water towers and we've been in a contract with them for I believe nine years so far um, because we have this contract uh, we contacted Suez for pricing on the purchase and installation of these uh, mixers within the two towers I requested both upfront pricing as well as a three-year pay down uh, of the acquisition cost in both cases, it was the same. So they're spreading it out over the three years. No interest um, do I have. It, it would be um, the same cost we paid for it right up front. Um, but we elected to do, uh, spread this out over three years uh, for cash flow purposes. Um, I've attached the pricing sheets from Suez as well as the CIP sheet for this project. The three-year cost for both towers equates to $88,692. It's my recommendation as city engineer to award the tower mixer project to Suez for the annual prices quoted in the attached contract addendum. It was also my recommendation to authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute the addendum on behalf of the city. And I know there were some questions on this. Um, basically, we if somebody else did this, we would have to pay, or they would have to pay Suez to do that inspection, as well as the cost of the mixer. So there's going to be the cost of the mixers and getting them installed, 
plus we're going to have the additional expenses associated with um, Suez inspecting them, which would be part of the overall project cost. That's why we elected to go strictly as an addendum with Suez for the installation of those mixers. Purchasing of the mixers, Rich, is part of this? Yes, they, they are okay. acquiring the mixers uh, and installing them. Okay, how much do we have an idea of what the mixers would go for separately? I mean, I'm just trying to understand exactly how much is yeah, the I, mixer, I how much I, is the install. Yeah, I don't have an idea on what that, that separate cost for the mixers would be. Okay. All right. You know, they're, they're, we're slated to drain the towers for inspection here in October. Okay. And uh, we were just trying, we were trying to make that timeline so that they could get installed yet this year. Sure. And is this been tradition on water towers themselves when we have something like this where whoever has the contract for maintenance that we would actually allow them to do the purchasing and such? Is there any history of this being done in the past? I mean, it's a pretty big project. I'm just wondering why we're not putting out the bid. Are we really going to cost ourselves so much more if they have to do the inspections on that? Yeah, it, it's, I know that uh, before when there was tower work done up on top or antenna work done on top of the towers, there was about a $6,000 upcharge, um, mm -hmm. not to us, to the company that was putting the antennas up on the tower yeah. to do, you have somebody come into town, do the inspection, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that benefits is they, get, they guarantee the install of this. So three years from now, if we have problems with these mixers, they're gonna, they're gonna go good to make them right. Mm -hmm. so is there a track record? No, there, there's, this is the first time we've done something inside of the towers okay. um, that was not associated as part of the maintenance. We said if they do work on the antennas on the outside, whoever's requested to put those antennas up, they have to pay that up charge for Suez to do that inspection. So yeah, there really is no track record. Okay. And the mixers, I'm just kind of curious on the other end of that, what is the purpose of the mixer in the tower? Is it just, Pardon? what is the purpose of the mixer? Basically what happens is, is that that water in the towers during the winter time will segregate. It'll get different temperature layers in it. By keeping it mixed, you don't have uh, the sediment. We don't have the ice build up, and we can keep higher water levels in the towers during that um, during the winter. Usually, we'll drop the water levels in the tower mm -hmm. uh, during the winter, and that ice still moves up and down. The ice that does accumulate in those towers moves up and down. With the mixtures, we'll keep that ice from building up. Uh, you may get a skim, but you won't get the, the large layer like we have in, typically. So thus, we can keep it at a higher level. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have none. Mayor, yes. um, I believe the form is, is in your signature file. <clears throat> There's only one authorizing signature line. We were just, I think in the past we've just typically written in the other signature line. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just add another one in there because yeah. it says you and I. Yeah. Very good. We'll fix that. Okay. If it's awarded. Somebody needs to make a motion tonight. I make a motion that we award the tower mixer project to Suez for the annual prices quoted in the track attached contract addendum and that we authorize the mayor and the city clerk to execute the addendum on behalf of the city. Second. Balagora? Aye. Haas? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. And Noah? No. Motion carried. Thank you, Rich. And you're staying for the auger boom truck replacement? Um, the current auger boom truck that we have, uh, number 43, is, a, is on a 1985 chassis. Um, and that was, that chassis is a repurposed plow truck. Uh, the boom and derrick that's on the back of that came off from an even older unit. And I tried to identify the year of that older unit couldn't find any records on it. Um, it's used um, 
various times throughout the year. It's not used frequently, but we use it when we set the Christmas tree. Uh, when they cut the Christmas tree, put it on the on the trailer. Uh, like I said, they will be down here. Alpena Power has typically set it, but they're there to assist with it. Um, the other activity it gets used a lot for is Suez. Um, they basically lease it from the city to pull uh, pumps on lift stations, etc., because it has that, that boom capability. Um, we looked at late last year, um, they identified that the, the frame had actually split under in the old boom auger truck. Um, not roadworthy. We pulled it off the road and took it out of service. Um, so we investigated various options. We looked at taking that old boom auger unit off, putting it on another chassis. We don't have any coming out of service because we've been rebuilding our dump trucks. So we looked at what was it, what it was going to cost to buy a chassis and, and put that on there. And it was what we felt cost prohibitive for putting a 40 plus year old auger boom on the back of a, of a truck. So Sean McNamara, took it upon himself to look for various other options. Uh, and one of those options, he happened to be um, looking on Craigslist and identified uh, a boom truck that looked in good shape and uh, would fit our needs. Uh, we authorized both the mechanic, the lead mechanic, and Sean to go over and take a look at it. They went completely through it, um, uh, looked at the engine looked at the, at the drivetrain, the assembly, uh, the boom and auger assembly, and uh, basically said it was in excellent condition. The, the gentleman who owns it, uh, he is owned uh, by his accounting over 400 of these units. He does, it's an airport lighting company. He travels all over the Midwest installing uh, airport lighting. He buys them, keeps them until uh, they have about 120,000 miles on them, and then sells them off. Um, and he repaints them every six years, whether they need it or not, just to maintain them. Uh, he has, he's going to be downsizing, getting out of the business. Uh, is his intent for getting rid of this? He actually had two of them there. This was the this was the one that we looked at. It was a little bit smaller unit uh, than the other one, and uh, looked like it would fit our needs. We said both Doug uh, Rosnowski and um, Sean McNamara did inspect it, um, and their recommendations on those vehicles was attached to this. Um, this is a, they said, brand new. If if we were to go out and try to buy a brand new one, uh, we would be looking at two hundred thousand dollar range for one. Um, talking to Doug Rosnowski, um, there's, it's, you don't see very many of them because usually they buy them, they keep them for 40 years. They run them until um, till they, they're done uh, in the private sector. This guy has a little bit different philosophy. Um, it's the exact same mention that we have in several of our other vehicles. And per Doug, uh, the engine alone in the truck is is worth six thousand um, dollars. That including boom, we anticipate getting twenty plus years service out of this. That's what we typically get out of. We don't put a lot of miles on them. Very very limited miles. Um, we more you know basically we'll take them to, to get to cut the Christmas tree down, get it on the trailer, and move it. it may help with setting the Christmas tree. This one does have a have a bucket on it which our old other one didn't. So in situations where if we have to have another bucket truck out to cut trees during a storm, so we can use this one too. It has an attachable bucket uh, that can go on there. So um, it is multi-purpose, um, but it is something that we anticipate the last 20 plus years uh, due to the use that we, we put on it. Um, so based on their reports, and recommendations, my recommendation to city engineer that city council authorize the purchase of this used auger boom truck for a cost not to exceed $20,000.
First of all, Rich, thanks for the, taking the trip down there and getting your eyes on this along with uh, the other two gentlemen who, who did that, and the reports were fantastic, good information. Um, 20000 sounds like a, a, a really good price, I mean, for all the equipment that you're getting. It, do you have any idea of what a market value is on this? Do they even do a blue book for these trucks that are this old? And that, that's, what, that's what Doug was talking about. There's not, there's not really a, a, a many of them out there to mm -hmm. look at what the cost would be. Now, we were very fortunate. A few years ago, um, we worked with Alpina Power when they retired mm -hmm. theirs, and I think we bought that one, I want to say, for about $12,000. A little bit different, doesn't mm -hmm. have the utilities, it didn't have the, the boom capability, didn't have the auger capability. It was strictly a bucket truck. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, I want to say, in the $12,000. And they'd originally, I think we were looking at fifteen, and, and they ended up selling it to us for 12000 that. So there, there's not many of them out there for a market value. Thank you very much. That's all I have, okay. Mr. Mayor. Anyone else? I think it's a good find. Um, yeah, the report great was find. great. I move we approve the purchase of the Auger Boom truck for a price not to exceed twenty thousand dollars. Second. Us? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Nielsen? Yes. Noah? Yes. And Walgora? Aye. Motion carried. Next up is re resolution approving the submission of a concurrence with petitioner's request for declaratory ruling regarding MDQ's lead in copper rules and direct city attorney Bill Piper to submit the paperwork needed. Yes. Taking the lead. Oh, you? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be Richard. Taking the lead yeah. on that. Um, on June 14, 2018, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality filed new lead and copper rules after one year of public meetings and input. Um, there was a, a number of issues, it, changes in the lead and copper rules, but probably one of the biggest ones is that the new rule shifts the burden of replacement of privately owned on private property um, lead and water services to the utility. Before we, you know, we would replace them up to the shutoff valve out in front of the sidewalk, and then it was up to the property owner to change theirs. Um, part of these rules that came down um, when this first came out, uh, DEQ told us don't do any more partial replacements. You know that, that we, we couldn't just replace a part of it because you're exposing that, if it's a lead service, you're exposing that lead. Um, but in the past, um, the city has always paid the cost to replace any water service in the city, city portion of it up to that shutoff line. Then it was the private property owner's responsibility to pay for replacement of that service back into their house. The, uh, these rules also require uh, the replacement of any galvanized pipe water services that we may run into if it contains what they call a lead gooseneck. Basically, you know, because it's tough to get the plumbing to, to fit right, they would use a lead gooseneck from the main and then make, then make that connection to the galvanized and then run the galvanized into the house. If we encounter any of those, then we have to replace the galvanized as well as that lead, or we would have to. And then uh, the city must also conduct a service pipe material inventory, including the private service lines, and then we have a 20-year window to replace those. We have to, we have to replace at least 5% of any that we have, um, have identified uh, per year for a 20-year period. Uh, the MDEQ is requiring that the cost of these new rules be borne by the utility. This will require that all customers of the city will be responsible, and, and that um, is DEQ's own words. Um, Mike and I uh, and Steve Schultz set in on a uh, webinar that the DEQ put on to try to answer questions on these new lead and copper rules. and. Well, a lot of the questions were, were or the answers to the questions were, we're going to have to get back to you on that. We're not sure. We, you know, we don't know. Um, 
the one thing they they did say, and they were they were very adamant about it. This is a cost that is to be borne by all customers of the utility. Um, well, the city has, based on our findings during construction projects, uh, a limited number of lead or galvanized services. We will still need to inventory the private property services and implement a plan to replace at least 5% of the identified services annually. Based on the best information we have available, we are estimating that, are, that there are approximately 110 lead or galvanized services, about 2.5% of our customer connections. We, uh, when we did fourth Bedford, fourth, fifth and Bedford, I think we found two or three um, other projects. We'll find them occasionally. We have not encountered any on Miller Street <coughs> today, uh, but that doesn't mean we won't as we continue up. Um, but we, we do find them on occasion. Um, they're not frequent. Um, they're not a, a, a normal thing that we find, but, but they are out there. So we, we took up the best guess uh, of information we had available and estimated about 110 of those services. Based on our tap-in fee cost for a one-inch water service of $3,535, that's typically what it costs us to go in, open the road, put a new service in, and uh, up to the curb stop and patch the street. Um, just the city portion of the service, the cost for, re for replacement of those 110 services would be about $388,850. To replace the private portions, which we estimate at 6,000 per site, some of them are fairly short, but there's some that go along the side of the house into the back house. So we, we, we took the best estimate on the end. Um, we'd be looking at about $660,000 for the projects. <coughs> Thus, total replacement costs could cost the utility $1,048,850. And this cost would need to be spread amongst all customers of the city. <laughs> this is certainly not something the city water utility has funding to undertake at this time, but is being forced via the new lead and copper rules, uh, which have beginning implementation activities as soon as 2020. Other communities have passed resolutions supporting a call for a declaratory ruling filed on behalf of the Great Lakes Water Authority, Detroit Water and Sewerage Department, and Oakley County, Oakland County Water Resources. I've prepared the attached resolution for the City Council's consideration. And this is basically a, uh, a mimic of another community's resolution that they passed. I think it was not Bay Cities. Or was, or was it Bay Cities? Yes, I think it was. I think it was, I think it was Bay Cities. Got it. Um, it's a mimic of that. <coughs> No questions, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Bill, you've read the resolution. I have. Um, and as our council, you would believe that the MDQ has exceeded the scope of the MDQ's authority under the state law? I do. I personally feel that that gives us, as our council, nowhere to, for me, nowhere to not support the resolution until it gets resolved. It's really, for me, it's not a question of mm -hmm. of the pipes themselves, but the authority that the MDQ has taken. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you, Rich, for your report. It, 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 and I, I guess just, it's certainly not, you know, it's not something we take lightly, lead, lead and copper. We, we have, and Mike Lewinsky is here if there's questions, but um, we have, and, and we comply with all of the lead and copper testing that have, uh, has been required. Uh, we use, we, we add a, a chemical to the water treatment to coat the inside of not only our pipes, but also lead surfaces, et cetera, which typically would shield the exposure of that lead to the water. Um, it is not something that, you know, we would say, oh, it's a lead service, that's fine, we're not going to worry about it. Sure. But it's just shuffling, shuffling the cost over to the utility 
is is where we have the real issues. Um, by our charter, you know, we're not allowed to expend public dollars on private property. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I move we approve resolution 2018-05. Second. Susan. Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Walgora? Aye. And Hess? Yes. Motion carried. I move we adjourn the closed session to discuss water and sewer litigation. Second. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Walgora? Aye. Us? Yes. And Johnson. Yes. Motion carried.